Hi, Megan. Hi, Nick. How are you? Good. How are you? Good. <laughs> Most of our clients already know who you are, but for those that don't, tell everyone who you are. Yeah, so my name's Megan, and I've been in Vancouver for about six years now, and I am a fitness coach, and I primarily work, well, I work with Nick at Forever Fit, and I also work with clients up at uh, the Blossom Spinal Cord Center um, with Ocean Rehab and Fitness, and most of those clients have some type of sustained spinal cord injury or MS or something else that affects their um, central nervous system. How long have you been working with people with MS? Um, so I started working specifically with people with MS probably about five years ago. It wasn't until I moved to Vancouver when I started really working uh, with clients with, with disabilities. Okay. Um, yeah, so basically about five years. And then before that, um, I had only actually really known one person with MS and that was my godmom. Okay. Um, and then once I moved here, now I, I, I know so many people with MS. So. So originally when you wanted to become a personal trainer, were you doing it with the interest of working with a certain population or a certain demograph, or did you just want to train everybody at the first, the first time you started? Yeah. When I first started, I was kind of like every new trainer, as you can probably relate. Um, I was new to the fitness industry. I used to be a dancer. So that whole transition was so new. I was just looking for work. I didn't really know what I liked. Uh, I knew I liked being technical because that was my dance background and I was really good at cueing people and working one-on-one. -on -one. Um, but it wasn't, I didn't really choose what I was into. It just kind of happened. And then I think working with the disabled population came when I moved here and I find it easy and fun because I have to be really creative and find really creative ways to do things with certain people that might not have the ability to do things like you and I can. So maybe if somebody doesn't have their grip strength um, or they're in a wheelchair, I have to be really creative on adapting things for them. Sure. And I think part of that is that creativeness I get from when I was like dancing and I don't really get that in another way. So it's, I get to be creative with my job, which is I think why I like it so much. So you're not really focused purely on the aesthetics component. Uh, these people are they have physical limitations and disabilities, like you said, right? Yeah, so I do have a few people that come to me that have physical disabilities that want to lose weight and okay. you know look better. Okay. But most of the time, it's more about functionality. If somebody has to do a lot of transfers from their wheelchair every day, if they're carrying a lot of extra weight, that's really hard on their shoulders. Right. So things like that are more important, postural issues. So a lot of people, as you know, with our desk jockey clients, when they sit all day, right, is they have all this upper cross issues, neck problems, back problems. So when you're sitting in a chair like 24 seven uh, and you lose your core function, you're gonna have a lot of issues. And so a lot of times it's like decreasing pain and increasing mobility. Um, being able to stay agile so they can, you know, maybe wheel fast enough to run with their little kid. Right. Uh, it's going to be a lot more of that stuff. But having said that, they definitely like the diet and people are usually wanting to still look good because they want the confidence, right? Sure. Like a lot of times they have a physical disability. They still want to be confident in themselves. So. so as a trainer, when you have someone that says, say I'm in a wheelchair and I come to you and I want to lose weight. I mean, do you train me the same way you would train someone who is not in a wheelchair? Like how do you diet me down to lose those, you know, 15, 20 pounds? Yeah. So diets, diets tricky because that's, I, even though I'm a certified precision nutrition, um, like I can prescribe different diet plans and work with clients on coaching them through their diets. I'm not an actual dietitian or nutritionist. And when it comes to things like spinal cord injury, there's actually a lot of other dietary um, things going on and things that you need to keep in mind. And that's actually out of my scope. Okay. So I'll give basic knowledge. Like sure. I'll give basic kind of probably like what you do for clients these are carbs, these are fats, these are simple sugars, this is why packaged food sucks, right? I'll kind of go through that stuff with them yeah. and just give them the knowledge so that then they can take that and work with their SDI nutritionist or their MS specialized nutritionist and kind of go from there. Um, teaching them how to shop for better food, preparing food easy when they have limitations, that kind of thing. So. The other aspect of that, you asked about how to diet them down and lose weight. When it comes to people with disabilities, they're not gonna be able to get their heart rate up the same as you and I are. Sure. 
uh, especially somebody with a spinal cord injury, if you have a, somebody that has a higher level injury, it actually can affect the heart rate. So their heart rate max would maybe be like you're walking. Oh, so wow. maybe, yeah. So card, cardiovascular per se isn't the same for them okay. as it is for you and I. So sure. it's, it's not like you're going to get this big calorie burn by doing that. Um, so typically you look for cardiovascular in different ways okay. and they're going to get a lot more benefit out of like a lot more of the physical training, like the, the weight training and a little bit more volume. Okay. And once again, it depends on the client and their disability. Um, but I find that the gym is such a big, important piece and a decrease in calories just overall would be like a general, um, way to say, it. because typically if you and I are walking and we're using our leg muscles, how many calories does that burn a day, right? And you and I have muscular legs for a male right. and a female. Right. And if you take someone who has atrophied legs with no function, hmm. they aren't going to burn nearly as much, right? So right. the calorie need isn't going to be as much. They're substantial, right? Totally, yeah. So their their metabolism is going to be very a lot slower. Well, that brings me to my next question: Is what's your opinion on all these fad diets, intermittent fasting, if it fits your macros, keto? Like, where do you stand on that? Yeah. So for able-bodied clients, I like to kind of say that any diet is going to work okay. for an, a certain amount of time. Right. Um, but a diet that isn't sustainable isn't really going to do what a client wants. Because I don't know about you, but from bodybuilding aside, I haven't had a single client come to me and say, I want to lose 20 pounds. And then after three months, I want to gain it all back. Right. I've never had someone say that. Right. So if it's not sustainable, I don't think it's a good option, but every diet will work. You just have to kind of find what works for that person. Sure. Um, there are fad diets. And of course people jump on those, right? Because they hear that so-and-so did it, who's famous and it worked. Um, once again, I think if some people, if it works for their lifestyle and they like it, great. Right. Um, things like inter intermittent fasting, keto, that kind of thing. For people with um, spinal cord injury and things like MS, a lot right. of those are actually very beneficial when okay. supervised by a doctor. Okay. Um, and for different reasons, um, sure. brain function, uh, pain levels, mm -hmm. stress. So not necessarily um, for like physicality reasons. Right. Okay. Yeah. So I think you and I kind of preach the same. We we talked about diet in the past, and we, I've always said the same thing to my clients. Look, if this diet is not sustainable, you're not going to be able to keep the results that you've achieved. Um, why do you think there are so many misconceptions about nutrition right now and dietary nutrition in general? Well, I don't know about you in agreeing with this, but I think a lot of it is like the supplement world too. Um, like healthy breakfast cookies and, and protein bars and all this, that is like a multi-billion dollar industry. And 100%. if everybody was fit and if it was all working, we wouldn't need to buy the products. Right. right? So I think a lot of it is just um, like a money grabber, right? Any new diet that someone can come up with that someone will follow and it will work right. Short time, mm -hmm. short term. We know the science is, um, people are going to want to do it, right? They're going to smack a label on it and do it. Right. Right. So I think that's why. And I think because health is so, uh, like especially the US, like I was living in in the states for a while, people are so unhealthy, like in general, that they're willing to try any quick little fix that they think will work, and they're willing to spend money on it. Right. And so I think it's just a really easy way to make a living for some people, unfortunately. No, I agree. That, that's why the supplement industry is a multi-billion-dollar industry. Exactly. Um, and I always tell people, you know, there's a lot of shitty supplements out there, and most of them don't even work. So yeah. I think if, you, if you're on a budget and it's between supplements and whole foods, always go for the whole foods first. And Absolutely. anything you have left over, maybe a little bit of uh, you know, supplement nutrition is fine, but always the whole foods first. Um, I want, you mentioned that you used to dance, but yeah. you didn't just used to dance. You used to dance like professionally, right? I did, yeah. yeah. I grew up as a dancer and then I graduated from um, UC Irvine in California with my dance degree and I was working there and I was doing some like choreography gigs here and there. And uh, I didn't really have like a nine to five to fill me up. It was just gig, gig stuff. And that's kind of when I got into fitness. My roommate at the time was, uh, he was an ex ski Paralymp uh, ski Olympian from the nineties. Okay. And he, he uh, introduced me to his friend who was opening her own fitness studio. Okay. And so she asked me if I wanted to apprentice under her and open it with her. 
And so that was my first like walk into the, that um, fitness world. And from then on, I just kind of, I don't know, I just looked back five years later. I was like, wow, I'm not dancing anymore and I'm doing bodybuilding shows. <laughs> so. Well, that brings me to my next question is you used to compete in bodybuilding shows. I did. And then you stopped. I did. Yeah. And you're officially retired from competing. Um, yeah, I was thinking about that today. Okay. Um, right now. Yes. Okay. I, I competed in shows. I came in as a total amateur. I never hired, like I didn't really hire a coach or anything. I did a lot of my own mm-hmm. dieting and, and workouts and stuff. I had a buddy I worked out with, but right. I wouldn't hire him. And so, and I did about five shows, six shows in five years. Okay. And I did it all for me. Like I never really went in caring about winning. Uh, that sounds lame, but it's true. I, I, I did it for the performing. Like I did okay. it all for that. Yeah. Like five minutes on stage. You didn't care so, how you placed. That wasn't. No, I didn't really care how I placed. I got excited when I did. Right. Um, but like I qualified for nationals and okay. it was like two weeks later and I was just like, no, I can't go. Like I'm exhausted. I need a break. Like I didn't care that much. Right. I see. What yeah. made you decide to, if you have, com- if you have retired, but what made you decide <laughs> to quit? Um, like I said, I was doing it for me and okay. I did, I tried six, six of them. Um, I got into it because I needed a challenge in the gym. I was, wasn't challenged with my workouts. I didn't really have direction and I fulfilled it and I did it and I didn't have anything else to prove. And I missed my social life. It's a huge, if you're doing it properly. It is a huge commitment and I had to give up a lot and I miss, I miss the balance. I, I mean, one of my biggest values in life is balance and I was missing that. So as much as I learned from it and I loved it, um, it took a while to get the balance back too. So if I was to do a show again, um, I think it would be like when I qualify for masters and I can do it when I'm like older. So. That's a few years from now. <laughs> so <laughs> yes, nowhere near masters yet. Um, you know, I work with a lot of clients, as you know, and I do help them compete for the stage. Um, but one thing I notice is after the show, there's a lot of post-contest rebound. There's a lot of yeah. body dysphoria. And like you said, it becomes very unhealthy. Uh, people have an unhealthy relationship with diet after the show or even during the show relationships. And um, did you experience any of that while you were competing? I, I was borderline having issues with finding balance with eating again. Okay. Um, but I, there's this, I can't remember her name now, but there's this, she's an IFBB pro figure lady. And she had like an online packet for like post show, like the transition for oh. figure. And so I've invested in that okay. and that helped me tremendously. Oh, okay. um, I followed that program for a year or two and I still refer to it today just to kind of touch base with balance. Okay. Um, if it wasn't for that, I think I would have been in trouble to be honest. So it was kind of like a reverse diet, would you say? It was, it wasn't anything you followed. It was more like mindset and journaling, um, explaining what, like not having guilt for certain things you eat so that you don't lead to a binge. Sure. Um, kind of just being kind to yourself in the transition and not making it this huge deal of like, oh, now I have to like punish myself because I ate a banana, you yeah. know? It was yeah, it's I it, it's super helpful. I've actually recommended it to some of my other clients that have thought of doing training, and I've said, you know what, if you're going to train for the show, look at this packet first and before you get into it, because this is the stuff that helped me. Sure. Because the mindset, if you're not in that mindset, it might look silly, yeah. but when you're in that mindset, it's super helpful. What's your opinion on the way social media has gone now with uh, the competing and not even the competing, just gym in general, but people yeah. taking these, I asked someone this yesterday. I'm like, I just wanted your opinion. When you see all these photos in the gym of people taking photos of their asses, the guys are just as bad as the girls. Um, and they're all doing it. I mean, you see it on Instagram. I know you don't do it. I don't do it. But what do you think that is? Why do you think that is now? You know what? I, I don't know. I think I know like, in, since I moved to Vancouver, I know that like com- the competing shows have become very popular. Um, and I don't really know what that is either. Um, maybe it's people needing that to feel like they need to lose weight. Okay. Um, it's some type of validation, I think. I mean, part of it, I think, is our culture, like yeah. especially, you know, younger, younger people like that, that grew up with social media. Right. It's kind of just it becomes normal to them. Right. Um, 
and maybe they need the validation. I think, I think people get a high off of seeing how many likes they get. And yeah. it's, it's the same as like your, your cell phone. Like when your phone gets a beep, like we get this instant high from it. Like, Oh, somebody texted me. Right. And it, it's, it's true for everyone, whether you like getting messages or not. Right. Um, so I think part of it's that. And I think the more we see it and do like the more we see that online, it just, it gets like numb and it just becomes no big deal. So people just do it because like, for instance, I put, po- I posted my first story for my ocean and ocean rehab and fitness um, account like a couple months ago. And it was the biggest deal to me ever. Mm-hmm. I was freaking out. I didn't want to do it. <laughs> yeah. I, it took me forever to post it. And okay. now it's no big deal. And I'm doing it all the time. Right. right? Cause it, so I feel like things just, I don't know. We're just moving in this direction, I think. Right, right. Do you think it's a good direction? Mm, not necessarily. Okay. I think balance, once again, balance. I think I think if somebody needs that validation from everyone else, I think they're in trouble. I think that you should get validation inward from yourself first. And if you can't, then that's like a self-project that maybe is worth looking into. Um, because that's relying on a lot of things that you can't control and are not valid for your happiness and your confidence. Right. No. Oh. And you know, I've worked alongside you, I, I think over five years now and mm-hmm. I've trained right next to you and not once I've ever seen you take a photo of yourself while you're training or even really a photo of a client or anything like that. And I had a client ask me the other day, how come you and Megan, you guys never want to do any filming of us and put us on, on your YouTube channels or anything like that, or your Instagram accounts. And I said, you know, I think that kind of devalues the service. Yeah. Where's your stance on that with trainers? I, I agree with you. Yeah. I think it's an invasion of privacy. Um, when I'm at the hospital training, if there's like a breakthrough with something with rehab, I'll ask them and take time to do it. But it's oh. also for like feedback for them. And I always ask if I can post it and I usually right. don't show their face. Right. But in terms of like you and I in, in that gym setting. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's, I think it's kind of in my, I feel unprofessional doing it because it's yeah. something I'm take. they're paying money to be with me and to, and to have me there a hundred percent. And if I'm taking time out of their paid time to get for me to get more likes or a new client, right. I feel like that's kind of in, that's kind of taking away from what they deserve and, and are there for. Um, I actually like how you do it when we do it. We have lots of videos and or not videos, uh, pictures and stuff of us training clients on your website. And, um, and I've used a couple as well on my platforms and that's great, but maybe people don't know that that that's like a real photo shoot. People know they're there like for a photo shoot, they're getting a workout, but it's for a purpose and it's, it's lit and you know, it's extra. It's not there. They saw us already that week. Right. And they're all and they're all compensated really well, just so everyone knows. Yeah, that yeah. Both those people were given free sessions or uh, you yeah. know discounts on uh, partner packages or small group sessions, so they were all yeah. compensated for those photo shoots. And, <laughs> and like, I do this. I do the same with my clients. It's, yeah. they, they don't just show up. It's you right. know they get paid for that. So yeah, they help you. You help them, right? Yeah, and and I think to just piggyback on what you were saying, um, with people doing it in their own workouts and stuff. I don't know if you have time to like take pictures of you in the gym, like all these pictures of people, no one, no one seems that sweaty. And there, a lot of the women's makeup is done. And it's just like, well, like, I don't know. I'm like you in the old school world. It's like, would you, would you ever see like Arnold Schwarzenegger do that? He no. can't like, he's, he, he doesn't have the energy to do that. No. Right. And he's so focused. I think it just takes away from the focus. Yeah. And I used to blame the generation. I said, Oh, these damn younger millennials. But then I'm just realizing there's people our age that are doing it now. And oh, some yeah. of them are even older. older. So I, I don't know if it's just the way society is going. I've had to learn to kind of accept it now. It used to really irritate me, but I've kind of, yeah. just, you know, as I get older, I'm like, you know what? It's not that big of a deal, but it is still somewhat annoying to see. Um, I want to talk about the elephant in the room, COVID-19. That uh, has had a huge impact on everyone. And you and I, I've really noticed it in the last, yeah. I'd say about two, three weeks, business-wise. Yeah, huge. I mean, I mean, I don't have to ask you how it's affected your business because I work alongside you, so I know. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> but, we're here YouTubing, so. <laughs> yeah, exactly, right? I mean, usually this time of day, Megan and I don't have any time to sit down and talk. Yeah. We barely have any time to talk when we're working. Yeah. But I have to ask you, I mean, what have you noticed in the last few weeks, first personally and then work-wise? Personally? Uh, personally, it's been touch and go. I'm super grateful. I will say that I am still able to work due to online. 
Right. Um, so I'm, I haven't been fired from anything. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I'm able to kind of control my schedule still. A lot of people can't stay that. So I am grateful that I do have, I still have my place. I'm still able to, um, have clients, um, still stay on track and check in with me online. That's great. Um, I'm a very schedule oriented person and I love to be busy. Yes. So this whole downtime thing and not being able to be social is kind of hard. Sure. Um, so I'm just trying to, you know, do as much as I can around as much as I can. And then till I run out of like little home projects. Um, so, it, so it's okay. The positive to that, cause I try and stay positive is I'm, it's allowing me to kind of connect with some people like on the phone and, you know, I set my mom up on Zoom the other day. Oh, it's nice. allowing me to do that kind of thing that I normally yeah. wouldn't take the time to do. Right. Um, in terms of work, like I said, even though I'm able to take clients online, mostly like clients that we see at Forever Fit, a lot of my clients need, need a lot of help. So a lot of my clients with spinal cord injury and MS, they need me to be touching them and they need me to be assisting them so they can't use my services. Um, and unfortunately, some of them are so disabled that my online services that I offer, they don't, they can't use them without someone there helping them. And right now with this isolation thing, that's almost nearly impossible because they pay for their home care, right? A lot of them have home care coming in and they are there for just enough time to maybe get them dressed and do their morning routine. And then they're out the door. They don't have time to work out with them. Right. right. So it, it cuts out this big group of people that absolutely need to be moving and they're not able to now. Well, now I know if your other business with ocean rehab fitness, that's your main business. Um, mm -hmm. Your location that you operate out of, uh, it's called park, correct? It's called park. Yeah. The physical activity research center. And it's right by Vancouver general hospital. Yes. It's, it's part, it's kind of part of it. Yeah. Okay. And coastal health. Um, they recently had to take over that location. Is that correct? Yeah, they took over the building in the okay. Blessing Spinal Cord Center okay. um, because they needed a site for um, COVID-19 testing for their staff. Okay, so none of your clients can come and use that facility now? No, it, it closed about two weeks ago from yesterday. Um, but as you know, with as quickly as this stuff's been spreading, yeah. um, I think it would have closed for that weekend, that next week anyways, just okay. due to like everything else had closed that Monday anyways. Right. So they ended up closing about two days early. Now, are you concerned that the clients you work with when hopefully COVID-19 ends in within the next few weeks or possibly months, but are you concerned that they're going to fall behind on their progress? Absolutely. Yeah. Right. I, it's a fact. Okay. If they're not able to, if they're not able to do certain things, um, at park, we have everything is wheelchair accessible. Um, so they wheel up to equipment. It's all air pressurized. Um, they have the assistance of me with, I have adaptive equipment. Um, we have things like plinths with their, which are like elevated mats so okay. that they can transfer out of their wheelchairs. Half of them can't get to the floor, right? right. So they're not able to get even just basic stretching that they oh, need wow. every day. So absolutely. And, and not only that, as you probably know, what, what comes with a lot of physical disabilities is a lot of depression and lon loneliness. Going to park is a very social place. And this was a, the only outing for a lot of these people. Right. And they all, like, my clients will train with me. And then four hours later, when I'm done my day, they're still there because they're chatting with other people. Sure. Or they've gone to coffee out in the lobby. Like, it's very social. So losing that, too, is, and not everybody can just jump online like this because maybe they don't have the use of their hands. Right. Right. So it's, it's going to be very detrimental to that group. Is there any talk about opening up another location where these people can go train out? Or are they so immune compromised that they can't leave right now? Are they a lot of these people in quarantine? A lot of them are probably in quarantine. It's okay. highly advised. Um, when, when you get into those physical disabilities, there's a lot of um, health um, compromises. Right. So a lot of them are highly recommended to stay indoors. I've offered um, a few house calls to some clients that are like walking distance and um, you know, then they've just, they're so compromised. They're just, they're said the only person they're risking seeing is their home care. And I totally understand that. But so yeah, they're really not able to see a lot of people because of the risk. You know, it's interesting because I've received a lot of emails in the last two weeks from some of our clients saying, what can I do? Um, you know, I, I, I can't go to the gym. All the gyms are closed. And I'm like, well, you guys can still move. You can still go outside. 
Um, yeah. Unless you are quarantined, but you can still move. And even if you are in your apartment, I mean, these are people who are not physically disabled. Um, yeah. And they're refusing to. I've had, I've had a few people tell me, I'm like, well, I should just, you know, I'll just wait until this blows over and then I'll get back on my diet and get back on my training. And then you have clients like yours who do have these disabilities and they really need to go and move and they can. Yeah. So, I mean, how lucky are we that we are able to do that? Right? Absolutely. And I think what people like, what people don't understand is, or maybe they just forget, but how good you feel when you move right? Like if you're sitting inside all day doing not a whole lot or at the computer or on your phone, you know, it takes a lot of effort to get off the couch and go for a walk. But when you're done, nobody's ever regretted that, right. you know, and it's that feeling that you have to, I think people have to remember to motivate themselves just to go do it. And even if you set it as an alarm, like for me today, I was like, okay, you can't make lunch until you go for a walk. Right. And so I, so I'm like, crap, I'm hungry, <laughs> you know? So like I get up and it's raining, whatever. I went for my walk and you end up staying out longer because it feels good. Do you think you that's know? something that you're born with or something that you develop over time? Like those good, those good habits, those work, good work ethic habits. Ah, uh, that's a good question. I, for me, I don't know any different because of dance. So sure. I was, I was bred to be disciplined. Right, right. Um, what do you think? Like for you? Yeah, I, I think the same thing. I think I, I always bring it back to bodybuilding. I mean, I've been okay. bodybuilding since I think I was like 14 years old. So wow. it's that structured lifestyle. Yeah. Okay, I have to have this meal next. I have to do this next. And now at my age, I don't even really do it for the aesthetics anymore. It's just engraved in me that, you know, it's like robotic. And yeah. I mean, I saw you this morning. You didn't even have a client and you came into the gym to do cardio at six in the morning. I'm like, <laughs> Megan, what are you doing here? You don't even have a client. I do my cardio. And I'm like, uh, well, when I say gym, I'm not talking about the gym we train at, but you know, just a, my home gym, right? Yeah. And so I'm just like, th th that's like right there. I mean, that's just work. Work yeah. right there, right? Yeah, so it's, it's true. I think it's just uh, something, I don't think you're born with it. I think it's something you develop over time. And like you yeah. said, you know, maybe your dance led you into that. Mm -hmm. but I think it's really important to have that. And some people just don't have that work ethic. Yeah. yeah. Um, if someone wants to get in contact with you, what's the best way? Um, yeah. So they can, they can email me. Um, I have two emails. Um, I'll just give my um, Megan at ocean rehab and fitness .com, okay. or they can give me, um, they can email me through my forever fit one, which you have. And I'm sure most of these people listening um, have your contact information. They can also follow me on Instagram at ocean underscore rehab or forever fit me again. Um, those would be the easiest ways. Okay. And you work with people both on the floor and online. I do. So I have an online platform that's geared at people with physical disabilities. Okay. Uh, and, and then I also, right now I'm taking, uh, able body clients online through zoom just while sure. this COVID-19 thing's going on because the gym is closed. Sure. I'm going to put all that information in at the bottom of this video so people can get in contact with you. Right. And I, I hopefully, I, you know, I'm hoping that people do reach out to you because there are a lot of people right now who they don't know what to do. Yeah. And I'm getting constant emails from people saying, what do I do? And I mean, it's hard to telling them you have to move and they say, well, there's no gym and it's an excuse. Yeah. So hopefully working with someone like yourself, you know, who, who does work with people who have physical limitations, you can show them some ways that they can move without actually going to a gym and having dumbbells and barbells and kettlebells and all these other things. Yeah. Oh yeah. You, you don't need fancy equipment. It's no. no. Great. Megan, thank you so much for spending the time with me this afternoon. I yeah, know thank you're you. not super busy, but <laughs> I know this is a hard time for us, but I'm hoping that we pull through in the next few weeks and you know, life returns to normal for everybody. Yeah. Yeah. Me too. Okay. Well, have a great weekend. Thank you. You too, I Nick. I hope to see you again soon. Okay. okay. See ya. Man.